Hello, Mr. Hardy here. And in this video, I would like to teach you about the poem Envy by Mary Lamb. We'll tackle this poem in five steps. Firstly, we will read Envy by Lamb. Secondly, we'll check our understanding of the poem, going through it stanza by stanza. Thirdly, we'll identify the poem's key message um, and the areas of conflict within the poem. Uh, the reason we're focusing on conflict is that Envy by Lamb is found in the conflict section of our poetry anthology for GCSE. Fourthly, I'll identify some key language, structure and poetic methods that Lamb uses in her poem Envy and that you can identify and write about in your answers. And finally, I'll leave you with a few tasks you can complete after the video um, to really solidify your understanding of this poem. So, Mary Lamb, she was an English writer. She wrote poetry and prose. Um, she lived in London between 1764 and 1847. Um, and unfortunately, at age 31, um, after suffering a mental breakdown, uh, she stabbed her mother to death. So this is the poem Envy by Mary Lamb. This rose tree is not made to bear the violet blue nor lily fair, nor the sweet minion A. And if this tree were discontent or wished to change its natural bent, it all in vain would fret. And should it fret, you would suppose, it ne'er had seen its own red rose, nor after gentle shower had ever smelt its rose's scent, or it could ne'er be discontent with its own pretty flower. Like such a blind and senseless tree, as I've imagined this to be, all envious persons are. With care and culture, all may find some pretty flower in their own mind, some talent that is rare. And that is it. A poem of three stanzas, very short and sweet. So what is going on? What is Lamb trying to teach us in this poem? In stanza one, uh, Lamb is asking the reader to imagine a rose tree that no longer wants to grow roses. Uh, instead, this rose tree wants to grow violets, which is a, a purple flower, uh, lilies, which is a flower that give off a really nice scent, aroma, and a mignonette, which is a sweet type of grass. Um, this rose tree wants to grow other flowers, but it will want in vain because naturally rose trees grow roses. So it's pointless for this rose tree to want to grow other types of flowers. In stanza two, Lamb is teaching us that by wanting to grow other flowers, such as violet and lily and mignonette, the rose tree is actually missing out on its own beauty, its own qualities. Uh, maybe the rose tree is jealous of the violet's beautiful purple flower. Well, if you look at line two of stanza two, um, it ne'er had seen its own red rose. Roses have their own beautiful red flower. So why is it being jealous of the purple flower? Or maybe this rose tree is jealous of the lily's beautiful smell. But if you look at line four of stanza two, hath ever smelt its roses scent. Um, after a rain shower, um, roses smell gorgeous. In fact, it's such a lovely smell that we use it in perfumes and soap. Um, so by looking towards other flowers and wanting to be other flowers, this rose tree is missing out on the fact that it has lots of its own really good qualities. And finally, in stanza three, um, Lamb is challenging the reader. Uh, she's saying, if you are envious like this rose tree, if you're jealous of other people, then you are being discontent and upset for no reason. And actually, you're missing out on your own beauty and your own talent, which you should be cultivating and developing instead of being envious of other people. So what is the poem's message? Um, I think it's quite simple. Lamb's message in envy is do not envy. If you want to take it one step further, you could say there's a secondary message. Um, instead of envying others, you should cherish your own unique talent and beauty. Um, so I think this poem's message is twofold. And where do we find conflict in this poem? Well, there's no real external conflict such as warfare or fighting or physical violence or, or verbal 
violence. Um, instead, I would say there's internal conflict, um, conflict that happens inside of you. Uh, the internal conflict is happening in the rose tree. Um, by wanting to grow violets and mignonets and lilies, um, the rose tree is trying to be something that it is not, and that would be quite uncomfortable. It can never fulfil its own potential. It's forever going to be jealous and upset. And I think Lamb does this intentionally to stir in the reader um, internal conflict. Perhaps they might remember a time in the past where they've been jealous and envious of other people. And this poem, I think, is designed to bring back, bring back those memories and feelings and challenge the reader and say, actually, there is no point being envious. Those feelings, those emotions aren't beneficial to you. So let's explore some of the techniques that Lamb uses in Envy. Um, I've split it into three categories. Uh, we have the red section, which focuses on language techniques. Uh, I've identified personification, simile, repetition, and a semantic field that Lamb has employed. Um, we have the blue section that's going to focus on structural techniques. Um, the poem is written in three stanzas. There's six lines per stanza. There's a tight syllabic structure. There is a rhyme scheme. And overall, this creates a nursery rhyme effect. And finally, the green section, um, these are poetic techniques that are unique to poetry and you don't tend to find in other types of writing. And we're going to look at some end stops and caesura that Lamb uses. So this is stanza one. Um, as you can see, it's made of six lines. Uh, line one has eight syllables. Line two has eight syllables. Line three has six. Line four is eight, line five is eight, and line six has six syllables. Um, this is what we'd consider a tight, a controlled structure. And I think Lamb does this to reflect the idea that if you are envious of other people, you might be feeling tight or controlled. You're not free to be yourself and, and develop your own qualities. You're contained, and that's an uncomfortable feeling. Alongside uh, the tight syllabic structure, there's also rhyme. Look at lines one and two, bare and fair rhyme. And look at lines four and five, discontent and bent rhyme. Um, by combining this rhyme scheme with a tight syllabic structure, I think Lamb is creating a nursery rhyme effect. And I think this is done on purpose um, because nursery rhymes are normally employed by adults who wish to teach uh, children or younger people a life lesson or a moral lesson. And I think in this poem, um, Lamb adopts the role of the adult and the reader adopts the role of a child. Um, and Lamb is teaching us not to be envious um, because it's uncomfortable and it's not productive. Have a look at the section in red. Um, this is where we see personification of the rose tree. Um, so trees can't feel the emotion envy. Um, whereas humans can feel the emotion envy. So by giving a human quality to a non-human object, we personify that object. And I think Lamb does this to universalise the concept of envy. What I mean by that is that I might be envious of someone for a different reason that you might be envious of someone. And for example, someone younger than me, um, and someone older than me might be envious for different reasons. Someone from another country or another continent might be envious for different reasons. We're all jealous um, of different things. Whereas by making a rose tree jealous of other flowers, we can all relate to this concept. Um, a rose tree wants to grow mignonette and lily and violet. We can all see that this doesn't make sense. It, it's not natural. It's not helpful. Um, so by using this example, and by personifying the rose tree, we can all relate to the concept of envy in this poem. I want to draw your attention to the last word in lines four, five and six. And those words are discontent, bent and fret. And all of these words are linked by the idea of being uncomfortable. Um, if you are content, it means you are happy. So if you're discontent, it means you're unhappy, quite uncomfortable. Um, if you're bent, it could mean physically you have been twisted out of shape. Um, again, quite an uncomfortable idea. And if you fret, it means you worry a lot or you're anxious. Again, it's not a comfortable state of being. 
So I think these three words, um, when used together, form a semantic field. They're all linked by the theme of discomfort. And I think Lamb uses this semantic field to drive home her message that, that envy is, is uncomfortable and it's bad for you. To further emphasise the semantic field, um, Lamb uses what we call end stops in poetry. That's when you put punctuation at the end of a poetic line. Um, so have a look at the green sections. Um, there's two commas, one after discontent, one after bent, and there's one full stop after fret. And what this punctuation does is it forces you to stop and consider the line that you've just read, but in particular, consider the word immediately before that piece of punctuation. Um, so not only has Lamb used the semantic field of discontent, bent and fret, but by putting them next to end stops, the reader is forced to stop and really contemplate these uncomfortable ideas of being discontent, of being bent and of fretting. And all of these things come from being envious. So clearly we don't want to be envious because we want to avoid this discomfort. So in stanza two, you'll notice there's also six lines. Um, lines one and two rhyme, suppose and rose. Lines four and five also rhyme, scent and discontent. Uh, the only thing that differs is that lines three and six have seven syllables instead of six syllables. But overall, it's still very tightly controlled um, and we still have this nursery rhyme effect. In red, you'll see uh, words that have been repeated. They're two of the words from our semantic field, fret and discontent. And I think these two have been chosen to be repeated because they really highlight internal conflict. Whereas bent is quite a physical discomfort. Um, imagine having your posture being bent and twisted out of shape. That's physically uncomfortable. Um, I think fret is mentally uncomfortable. That means you worry a lot or you're anxious. You're uncomfortable in your mind. Um, that would be an internal conflict. And I think discontent, which if you remember means unhappy, I think that's an emotional conflict. Um, we all want to be happy, but by being envious of others, we become unhappy, discontent. And again, that shows internal conflict within a person, um, or in this case, within the rose tree. Um, so I think these two words from the semantic field have been repeated to really highlight internal conflict. So in stanza one, um, the end stopping was used for emphasis, um, whereas in stanza two, if you look at line one, um, there's a comma after fret, and should it fret? When we have punctuation in the middle of a poetic line, we call that caesura. Um, it has the same effect as end stopping. It's meant to make you focus on the line that comes before the punctuation mark, the bit of the line. Um, and it also makes you focus on the word that comes immediately before that piece of punctuation. So I think Lamb really wants us to focus on this idea of fretting, of worrying. Um, and this is a consequence of being envious. So we should avoid that emotion. And in stanza three, again, we have six lines. Um, again, we have that tight syllabic structure. Um, there's slight differences. Um, in lines three, there's seven syllables. In line six, there's six syllables. But overall, it's still very tight and controlled, just how envy might control you. Um, again, lines one and two rhyme. We've got tree and bee that rhyme. And again, lines four and five rhyme, find and mind. And we still have this nursery rhyme effect going on throughout the poem. Uh, the section in red at the top, lines one, two and three, um, this is where Lamb uses a simile to compare envious people to this silly rose tree. And she does this to emphasise this message that if you are envious, it, it really doesn't make sense. Um, like such a blind and senseless tree, as I've imagined this to be, all envious persons are. Um, she's using like to compare people who are envious to this silly rose tree. So that would be an example of a simile. Um, again, in the final stanza, stanza three, we go back to end stopping to create what's called a didactic tone. Uh, didactic is just a fancy way of saying teaching, really. Um, and it creates a tone that a teacher or an adult might use when they are trying to instruct a child or someone younger. Uh, they normally say a very important sentence and then stop and pause and allow that younger person to process it. Um, so have a look at the, the first half of this stanza. 
like such a blind and senseless tree as I've imagined this to be, all envious persons are. The colon has a nice final pause, final stop, and it makes us really consider, um, is it worth being envious? It, it makes no sense. It is literally a senseless thing to do. Okay, so post video tasks, um, things you can do to really solidify your knowledge that you've acquired from watching this video. Um, firstly, you can make notes on a physical copy of the poem. So maybe you have an anthology or maybe you can print off a physical copy of Envy by Lamb um, off the internet and make notes using a pen, using highlighters, using different colours um, of the information I've given you. Um, maybe you want to identify different language, structural and poetic features. Uh, maybe you want to make a note of the poem's message and the idea of internal conflict. Maybe you even want to make a few notes about Mary Lamb herself. The second thing you can do, which I think could be really useful, is you can answer the question, how does Lamb explore emotions in envy? Um, this is a question I've made up. Um, and I think you could answer it using the structure I've suggested below. Uh, you could start with a short introduction explaining which emotion you're going to answer in your question. Um, the obvious choice would be envy. Um, you may want to include a bit about the poem's message and about conflict in the introduction. I would then recommend spending one paragraph maybe identifying a couple of language features. Maybe you want to focus on that simile and the personification Lamb uses. Um, your third paragraph could be centred around the structure and how Lamb has employed three stanzas of six lines of a tight syllabic structure with rhyme to create a nursery rhyme effect to didactically teach the reader about the dangers of being envy, envious. Um, fourth paragraph, you could look at these poetry specific techniques such as end stopping and caesura and how they support that semantic field of discomfort Lamb has created. And finally, you could draw a conclusion. How does Lamb explore emotions and envy? What is the purpose of this poem? Um, what should we as readers take away from it? Okay, so if you have found this video useful, please press that like button. Um, secondly, if you would like to see more YouTube content, please subscribe to the Mr. Hardy channel. I'll be making videos about poems and things related to English literature and language, such as Shakespearean texts, writing techniques, punctuation, etc. And thirdly and finally, please leave a comment letting me know the next poem you want me to explain to you um, on YouTube. So thank you very much for your attention and I will see you on the next video.